Hey everyone, my name is Erica Bolofsky. I'm the Community Outreach Specialist with HD Reach. Um, I'm here with my co-host. Lauren. <laughs> yep. Uh, she is here. She is with Help for HD, does the Help for HD podcast, and has agreed to be co-host on our Rare Topics for uh, a Rare Disease. Um, and today I am so excited because we are talking about just another topic that um, we felt that was a little underserved, but is is something that is happens a lot within the HD community. Um, and we've decided to have some fun with the title for a not so fun topic, um, sex, drugs, rock and roll and HD. And so what that means is we're gonna be talking about addictions. So in our, our sing song way, we're gonna be talking about a very powerful topic that, um, that many families and many individuals struggle with today. Um, and I am so excited because we have Dr. Catherine McDonald here uh, with Vanderbilt. Um, Dr. McDonald, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are? Yeah, sure. So I'm Catherine McDonald. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm excited to be on with you guys. Um, I've been at Vanderbilt for almost 10 years now. Um, I came down for a fellowship um, to study um, kind of how cognitive and movement disorders um, intersect. And so HD really became kind of the example of a condition um, that causes really challenging symptoms, kind of bringing those two um, categories together. And so I started studying um, HD during my fellowship and just fell in love um, with the families. Um, and so it's now uh, most of what I do is, is um, treating HD patients and their families. Um, and so kind of with my background, what became really interesting to me was how HD impacts cognition and behavior. Um, and so as part of that, I've um, started kind of a research program looking at what are some of the early behavioral symptoms that we can see in HD um, and how can we um, kind of better screen for these and hopefully better treat them kind of as the disease goes on. Very, very important work. And, um, you know, I, I don't know, I, I feel like this community, like it, it has such a um, it has a great way at just uh, capturing people and making people fall in love and wanting to really commit time and, and their professional space to this disease. So I always enjoy hearing that because it's you're, you're here with a, a beautiful heart for uh, this community and wanting to to bring in all this new research. That's so important. You know, yeah. I hear that, too, all the time, just that that um, those who are professionals not directly affected by HD when they meet the families, um, they just truly, um, like you said, fall in love with them and, and really become part of the community for that reason, um, which is why we hate when our experienced HD professionals go away <laughs> because they work so hard for us. So it's really, you're right, it's really nice to see. And I, I think we just have such a unique community um, in that area. So thank you for being here and thank you for for all your work that you continue to do every day we we totally totally appreciate it um so now getting into our our topic i do want to kind of start off and ask about hd and like the effect of the brain and the nervous system like can that cause addiction can that i mean what would you say on that yeah it's a great question it's something that we're you know we're trying to kind of learn more about so as as you all know hd is a genetic condition um, that causes an abnormal protein to build up in the brain um and so the regions of the brain where this protein builds up um can kind of help you understand the symptoms and so we typically think of hd in kind of three categories so there's motor symptoms those are the movement problems like chorea, like balance problems, like coordination problems. Um, their mood symptoms, so things like depression and anxiety, irritability, um, and then their cognitive symptoms. And those are typically things like um, difficulty with decision-making, processing, judgment, and memory. Um, those things all intersect um, and they affect people with HD in really different ways. I think one of the things that um, struck me about HD. It still strikes me about HD. And I think our family also as well as, you know, just how different people are, even in the same family um, with, you know, presumably a very similar gene. Um, it can have very, very different impacts um, on people. And so what we do in clinic is to try to sort out, you know, how, how is HD affecting this person um, and how 
Um, is it affecting them today versus tomorrow versus next week? I mean, all of that can change. Um, and so what we know is that, you know, with this sort of combination of effects on mood, behavior, and cognition, some people do develop addictions um, and they develop kind of difficulty controlling their behavior. Um, and that's something that, that we, are, we are trying to learn more about kind of in our, in our research as to why that happens and, and how that happens. Thank you. Now, can like, can addictive substances um, or some of these behaviors, can they worsen the symptoms of HD, would you say? They definitely can. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think the, the types of addictions that we see in clinic, um, again, vary. Um, we see people who can develop difficulties with substance abuse, so things like alcohol use, um, tobacco use is another big one in our clinic, um, and then other drugs, you know, methamphetamine, opioids, kind of the, the harder drugs of abuse um, can, all, can also come up. And we think, again, that um, this probably relates to people having some deficit in kind of impulse control. Um, we think some patients may have kind of a, an overactive response to reward, which can play into to drug use um, and have difficulty kind of understanding the consequences of those behaviors. Um, and so these, these things can kind of get out of hand. Um, and so you can definitely, if you think about kind of how these um, substances affect, you know, people without HD, you know, alcohol, for instance, can definitely cause further impairments in judgment, um, further impairments in decision making. Um, it can worsen depression, it can worsen mood liability and irritability, which are already kind of a problem in HD. Um, it can impair balance and kind of lead to falls and those sorts of things. Um, and then stimulants are another category where for patients with HD, um, you know, kind of tend to be drawn to things that start, sort of stimulate their brain. And I think this um, can come out of, you know, some of the symptoms of sort of kind of a deficit in focus or concentration. Um, people report a lot of fatigue and sleep problems in HD, and so people are often drawn to things um, like caffeine, like nicotine, um, like amphetamines um, that sort of, um, you know, can, can spark kind of a, a little bit more activity um, in those areas. And so we, we see people you know, turn to stimulants for that. And we know that stimulants can be good in some ways, but they can also worsen things like chorea. Um, they can worsen things like mood liability and, and irritability. And so I think it's always a careful balance in our clinic um, of figuring out, you know, why someone's using this substance what are they kind of trying to treat with this and kind of what are some of the adverse effects that it might be having? Now, let me, can I ask a quick question? Um, yes, just because you have HD doesn't mean that you, you are going to be addicted to something, right? It's not, it's just that it's, we see addiction more, you know, but it's not for everybody that is going to get addicted to something, correct? Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, and I think one of the things that we realized in our clinic was that we weren't doing a good job asking about this. Um, you know, we'd find out about these behaviors a lot of times after they caused a crisis. So someone got a DUI, someone got arrested for drug possession, um, someone, you know, had a, a really severe life consequence because of their addiction. Um, and so we started trying to kind of screen for this and kind of more proactively ask these questions in clinic. And so we um, published a paper a couple of years ago on kind of a small set of our patients, but we'd come up with a questionnaire to ask about these sort of risky type behaviors. Um, and we found out that they're very common. So it was around 80% of patients and 90% of caregivers reported some sort of like risk taking type behavior. Um, that can be risk taking in terms of, you know, finances driving um, illegal activities and substance abuse was definitely on there. Um, and I think it was around 20% of people reported some difficulties with substance abuse and the disease course. So it's, it's by far not everyone, um, but you know, I think we're trying to figure out, um, you know, is this more common than the general population? Is this some sort of um, brain network change that's predisposing people? Um, are there environmental effects as well of just kind of the stress of being part of a family with HD and, you know, understanding your risk for this disease um, and all that I think goes along with it. Dealing with, dealing with generational traumas and things like yes. that as well. And yeah. Yes. Um, have you seen like, I guess, within your pool that you have seen of, of, of patients, is there uh, a type of addiction uh, or something that um, you see more of the community members leaning towards whether it's like cigarettes or tobacco use or alcohol or is there something that kind of is at the higher tier um, that you see more commonly 
Yeah, I think cigarettes and alcohol are probably the, the two most common. Um, we have a lot of patients in our clinic that smoke. Um, and it's, you know, it's a balance because it's something that they enjoy. They derive some, you know, beneficial effects from it. Um, but it can be dangerous. You know, it's not good for their long-term health. Um, you know, in the later stages, patients can fall asleep with cigarettes. They can drop them on themselves. It can cause fires and burns and those, those sorts of things. Um, and so like everything is kind of a balance. Um, but I think probably alcohol and tobacco are the two um, most common. Um, caffeine as well. People use a lot of caffeine. Mm -hmm. um, and again, kind of knowing what the, what the limits of that is, I think is important. Um, and I think it's a minority that kind of get into the, the, the harder drugs, things like stimulants and opioids and those kind of things, but that, that definitely happens too. Yeah. Caffeine was going to be my big question because, um, that's what I see, you know, in the community a lot, even with my dad and, um, his favorite was diet Mountain Dew. And like, he would have, we're talking, you know, four or five bottles of the, you know, the little, um, the little bottles a day. And it was just so he could stay awake because he was so tired all the time. He's so fatigued. So um, I had asked in the community about it and it come to find out like a lot of people are dealing with that and they drink a ton of caffeine. So I find that interesting. Yeah. We've seen in our clinic too, that people just tend to drink a lot of fluids, like not even necessarily alcohol or caffeinated beverages. People just drink large volumes and it tends to be some like something that they get kind of stuck on. Sometimes it is something caffeinated like Mountain Dew. It can be tea. It can be coffee. Um, it can be like flavored waters. It just seems like people just, it tends to be kind of a fixation in HD. So they just tend to, to drink a lot throughout the day. And so if you can kind of substitute other stuff for that, so um, caffeine-free sodas um, or kind of lower caffeine teas or decaf coffee to kind of like dilute some of that volume that they're taking in every day. Um, I think it, it, it is sort of, sort of a perseveration, I think, for some people in HD that they just, they have to have something to drink kind of all day, all day long. We, we definitely see that too. That's uh, interesting. I never thought about that. Yeah. I had somebody once tell me that, you know, they, they repeatedly smoke cigarettes and then their routine is to go to the store, get more cigarettes, to come back <laughs> home, to smoke more cigarettes. And when I asked, you know, well, you know, why, like, is there a way of us trying to, cause you know, like you mentioned before, like burns and, and fires like that, that is a concern, especially if somebody might be by themselves or have like limited access to a caregiver who, you know, can only see them at certain times a day. Um, and the response was, I'm bored. And that was what they focused on because that was something to do throughout the day. Um, I guess, is there, a way of going like, like maybe this isn't like, I know it has a, this negative connotation and yeah, there can be some negative effects to the body. Um, and, and, and obviously like being bored, if there is like safety factors to think about, I guess, what would you say is higher on the level? Would it be like quality of life? Um, how do you know, like, I guess if it's really a safety hazard that really needs to be addressed, like when do you know that? That makes yeah, sense. That's one yeah. one winning question. <laughs> no, I think those are always hard things to balance because you know these people are dealing with an incurable disease, and if something brings them happiness, it's hard <laughs> to take that thing away. Um, so I think if someone is smoking, you know, I would normally advise patients to stop. Um, in this context, you know, if it's the one thing that they're happy doing and they're doing it in a safe way, you know, I'll kind of be a little more lenient with that. But you're right when it gets to the point where it is causing, you know, direct hazards to them or to someone else, like they're, they're causing fires, they're burning themselves. Um, and I think like you mentioned too, you know, I think these things kind of play into like sort of a fixation in, in HD. And so they're going out and buying cigarettes because that's what they do every day. And so it becomes kind of a habit and kind of a, a, a routine for them. And, and people with HD tend to be big on routines. Mm -hmm. And so in our experience, if you can kind of like break up that routine or replace it with something else um, and give them something constructive to do during the day, um, those kind of, you know, bad habits tend to taper off a little bit. And so getting people started like in a day program, um, getting them, you know, out and involved in the community, kind of having someone from home health come over and visit them, you know, during the day, just some way to kind of break up that, that pattern and that habit, 
Um, so they'll kind of forget about these things that, that used to be, you know, really, really important to them. Um, and so it's just kind of working with patients and families to figure out, you know, what's, what's kind of driving this behavior when it becomes problematic. So when it becomes, you know, a safety hazard um, acting on that, um, but kind of strategizing, you know, how can we maybe replace that with, with something else that's a little more, a little more productive. When it comes to smoking, do you think like if, if they're really just dead set on smoking, maybe switching to vaping instead. And, and I mean, obviously um, it's just replacing one with the other, but it would seem that maybe vaping would be safer than smoking. Yeah. And I think we have a lot of, you know, other options now. So like e-cigarettes and vaping, I think definitely, you know, you can still kind of get the nicotine. You can still kind of get the, um, the sensation of holding something um, right. and smoking it, but without some of the dangers like of fire. Um, so I do, I, we do have some patients that have kind of switched to that and it's been a little bit, a little bit safer for them in terms of like the fire risk. Yeah. So that's a great, um, cause if they even make vapes like without nicotine and yeah. vapes that are limited to like 500 puffs, I think, or that, like you can, you can have a certain amount that are literally you throw it away. Like they're not, you don't have to plug them in and all that stuff and recharge. Like they're reusable things that can that can get tossed out um, that I don't know, like that's very interesting. And I think something good for families to know that that might be something to try out. Yeah. Um, but also supplementing the day um, would have you had any experience with like vocational rehab, like like other people like doing anything like that where they can do a little type of part time work or something? Yeah, so we, we have, we're lucky that we have a great social work team at our clinic. And so they are really good at kind of identifying community resources. Um, and so we had, you know, our patients, you know, oftentimes lose their ability to work really young and go on disability before they ever thought they would have to. And so kind of losing that job and losing that career, they lose a lot of social, social interaction. They lose a lot of kind of that daily routine, their sense of like, you know, themselves having meaning and, and being productive parts of society. And so finding ways to supplement that and kind of replace that are really important. So like volunteer work can be huge. Um, even like getting a part-time job. Like we had one patient who was really struggling, did not want to be on disability. He kind of thought it meant that his life was over. And so we sat down and talked to him. And we're like, what do you want to do? And he's like, I want to be a greeter at Waffle House. And we were like, perfect. And so we got him a job at Waffle House and he was super excited and happy every day to go there. And so it can be something that simple, you know, just like something that they can do um, to be out in the community and feeling like they're doing something. That's another really just amazing, like really important point to bring up where it's like um, for families watching this video and if they're experiencing some of these things with their loved one or if you personally are experiencing something, um, if you are impacted by HD, um utilizing a team effort utilizing if you have access to a social worker or you know you can reach out to hd reach to help you locate your local resources but if you're close to what they call a center of excellence which vanderbilt is um that has hd specific clinics they have these a lot of time they'll have a team where you can have multiple people have these different approaches to help you strategize what is best for you personally and your family and I know that's what you guys do so well, Dr. McDonald, at, at um, Vanderbilt is um, being able to take very complex situations and kind of dissect them and yeah. come together as a team. Yeah, I don't think anyone could do this alone. This is definitely a, a disease that requires a team. Um, and we're lucky to, to have that. I think everyone has like you said, different approaches. Everyone's an expert in a piece of this. It's really hard to be an expert in, in all of it. Um, and patients respond differently to different team members. So they might not want to come to clinic and see me. You know, that sounds like it's very intimidating to have to come to Vanderbilt and go to clinic and see a neurologist. People are like, not going to do that. But if you can get them to come in and meet with a social worker, get them to come in and, and you know, do a research study, um, get them to meet at the coffee shop down the street, you know, kind of these baby steps to kind of get them involved with some part of our team. Um, and then we can kind of start start working on this. Yeah, yeah. Even I guess maybe even like a, a family physician that they've gone to for a lot of years, but um, uh, I, I believe with centers of excellence, a lot of times you guys will help with providing some education and helping maybe if there is somebody who is in like a more rural town, um, is that something that you guys tend to do? 
to provide some maybe a little education or some some assistance there? Yeah, we can definitely do outreach um, with physicians who are kind of, you know, out on their own, but might have like a pocket of, of HD patients they care for. Um, so we have education days. Um, we have kind of like a Southeast HD symposium we do every year. So we invite kind of community physicians and people that are um, are treating these patients. And um, we've done like in-services with nursing homes, for instance, who might care for some of our HD patients um, to get educate them on, you know, kind of some issues that might come up and how to deal with them. Um, so we try to try to expand kind of our outreach in the community because not everyone can come to Nashville. You know, we, we have a lot of patients that are out in rural areas and don't have a lot um, around them. And transportation is a challenge. And so if we if we can extend our reach into those communities, that's what we try to do. So if you are watching this video, OK, and you feel like you are alone in your 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 story, your journey with Huntington's disease, you know, it takes multiple people to, to be involved. You need a team, you need support around you. So reach out to, like I said, you could start with HD Reach and we can help connect you to uh, Dr. McDonald. We can connect, we can see what your local resources are closest to you. Um, but if you are dealing with something such as addiction or you're starting to see some changes within your loved one and you feel like you don't know where to go, reach out to us and continue watching this video um, and a lot of our other videos, because this is, we all work together for the betterment of this community and it's incredibly important to know that that you are you will have support and you can have support um, and you deserve it we're here um so now that i'm off that little i, I like to say my little spiel here and there because uh, you know obviously this community is very near and dear to my heart um but i want to move on are there any types of medi medications or treatments available that would kind of help manage both addiction and hd kind of together or are there any that really kind of clash that you're aware of? Yeah, definitely. So I think, you know, we're lucky in that we tend to treat kind of mood and addiction symptoms in HD like we would really in anybody. Um, and so a lot of the mood medications that we use in HD can also help with addiction. Um, so there's some antidepressants that can kind of have a, an effect on both, um, you know, mood as well as addictive tendencies. Um, things like bupropion is one that um, is used by psychiatrists to treat addiction. It also is, can be beneficial for mood in HD. Um, some of our antipsychotic medications that we use for chorea and mood in HD can also, you know, um, treat some of the kind of impulsivity that might lead to addiction. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, going back to this kind of team-based approach, we um, collaborate closely with our psychiatry colleagues. Um, we actually have, you know, a pretty active addiction clinic um, at Vanderbilt. And so we, um, we work with them um, and they can, you know, bring our patients in and then they have access to kind of all the resources of that clinic as well. Um, so, you know, specific addiction, like medical treatments, um, they have support groups, they have behavioral therapy, um, they have partial hospitalization programs where someone's really going through um, kind of a difficult time. Um, they have kind of dual diagnosis programs if you have addiction and depression um, or addiction and a mood disorder. Um, and our patients, um, you know, are, are candidates for all of those things as well. And so they're, um, it's not, you don't really have to treat them differently because they have HD. Um, I think they, we can, we can often kind of successfully treat, treat both with, with similar approaches, which I think is the good news. Is that like insurance based typically, or is that just, you know, if you're, once you're in Vanderbilt on your programs, on your support programs, that that's kind of included in that. The case. Yeah, I think, you know, they're all insurance based. And so I think we are lucky at in our HD clinic, we have a lot of resources to supplement when someone does not have insurance. Um, it's harder to access behavioral health. I think that's probably true <laughs> across the board. And so a lot of times, you know, they have kind of a, a shorter list of insurance providers that they accept. And so we do have to kind of work within that realm sometimes, um, but we're pretty creative and we can often help people kind of access those services um, if they need them, you know, in, in different ways. But yeah, insurance is something that we always run up against, especially in, in mental health. And there should not be that line there, but a lot of times there is. I think that's that's really great to hear, though, that that Vanderbilt yourselves have access to certain resources and certain things to, you know, and, and for, again, anyone watching, you know, check your, your local centers of excellence um, or um, just your local HD clinic. And it does not hurt to ask. It does not hurt to ask, um, especially if you are really needing um, 
really needing some sort of treatment and support. Um, some places do have these financial um, financial insurances where they cover within their 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 hospitals. Um, so it does not hurt to ask. Hypersexuality. Is that something that you feel comfortable yeah. um, touching on? I've I've heard some some situations where there's there's porn involved, there's social media contact with others. Um, have you experienced that within your clinic? Yeah, we definitely have. This is something that you know that also that also comes up. Um, I think you know HD can definitely impact sex drive in different ways. Some people find that it decreases and they're just not as interested anymore. And some people it kind of goes the other way and people can kind of become hypersexual. Um, and like you said, you know, like like anything, you have to kind of figure out when this is becoming detrimental. Um, if someone's watching more porn, you know, sometimes that makes caregivers very anxious and very disturbed. Um, I have to kind of figure out, you know, is this detrimental or is this just kind of, you know, what they're doing right now? Um, but in some cases, it definitely can become dangerous and have really severe effects on people's relationships, people's careers, um, and be dangerous for the patient. You know, I think these RHC patients are vulnerable. You know, they they don't have a lot of the same judgment and risk awareness um, as other people in society. We've had patients who have become victims. They've reached out to people over social media, um, over dating sites, have gotten picked up by strangers, um, they've been exploited, um, and are, aren't even aware that that's what's happening. Um, we've had patients who have been put in jail for sending inappropriate pictures to minors. Um, so these can have, you know, kind of real social and legal consequences. Um, we've had patients that, you know, lost jobs because of this kind of behavior or lost marriages because they've been unfaithful. Um, and so it's it definitely something that that happens and can have really severe consequences. Are there any treatments to help with that, with with that part of HD, the hypersexuality side of it, if it's what you're dealing with and the asexuality side? Yeah, definitely. So it, there are medications that can that can help with both, actually. Um and as far as the, the hypersexuality, we often will use, there's certain types of antidepressants that can actually help to kind of suppress sex drive um, as a side effect. Um, we'll sometimes use hormonal treatments as well, like progesterone is a really simple one um, that very effectively just kind of removes that interest um, and helps to kind of suppress it. Um, and so it typically is kind of a combination of using medications um, that kind of have those side effects to decrease sex drive um, with things like setting boundaries, um, taking away smartphones, access to social media, um, dating sites, places where people can kind of get themselves into trouble, um, kind of increasing supervision. Um, and it's, again, you know, it, it takes kind of a, a team to work with families and it takes a lot of, of trust, you know, to kind of build up with these families for them to tell you about something like this. This is often something that they don't want to talk about. Um, and so you know, like a lot of these things, we find out kind of at the end of the clinic visit when we're on our way out the door um, after like some crisis has happened. And so we try to be proactive about like building up that trust ahead of time um, and, you know, asking questions like this. So people will know that, you know, this is a thing that can happen in HD um, and it's okay to talk about and there are ways to, to address it. Do you feel like sometimes they like the family member just like that's their way of protecting their loved one by keeping this like they're afraid police will will be involved they're afraid that if they talk about this it's going to open up a whole can of worms oh for sure that's yeah the, that's the yeah feeling. definitely do you, do you feel that if there were like a plan in place first you know you talk about you just talked about telling at the end of a, a visit and things like that after a crisis has already occurred. But if it were something that we were to address beforehand, so it's not as taboo, the whole reason we're doing this webinar, um, you know, do you feel that would help greatly with, with these instances? Because there'd be a plan in place, not only for caregivers, but for the patient to know kind of how to deal with what they're feeling. Um, because I, I just imagine that it's really hard to deal with these urges that maybe you haven't dealt with before and you don't know what to do and you're ashamed of it. But if there were a plan in place, maybe it would be easier to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. And so we, I think education is a big thing um, that I think can, can really make a difference here. You know, when we were coming up with this kind of 
this, this kind of risk-taking behavior questionnaire, a lot of the questions were about sexual behavior because that's something that we'd run into in our clinic. And so we kind of made this like list of things that we had encountered as physicians. And so we started asking people, you know, have you experienced this? And it was eye-opening. People would come in and say, oh my gosh, I had no idea this was part of HD. I just thought that my husband was doing these things and it was just because, you know, he didn't love me anymore or because he's going crazy or, you know, all of these, these strange things. And they, they just never even thought that it could have been part of the disease. So I think explaining that, you know, these are things that we can see, they don't, they won't affect everybody, but, um, you know, it, it can definitely happen and coming up with sort of a safety plan um, and kind of, you know, ways to, to kind of identify early warning signs um, before right. things result in a crisis, I think is, is, a, is a good way to address those. Right. Be proactive rather than reactive to it. Mm -hmm. And I guess hearing like, this isn't shameful. Exactly. This, this is not shameful. This is yeah this is a piece of hd that 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 is affecting the brain this has nothing to do with the caregiver this has nothing to do with that person who they've been for the however many years they've lived up to this moment um this is a temporary space that hd is causing and try not to feel shamed because nobody is at fault here yeah definitely and these things seem to come in kind of spurts as well. So it's like people will do great for years and then all of a sudden something changes and all these behaviors start to kind of come up. Um, and so we'll, we'll kind of like reach this peak where, oh my gosh, it's like a crisis every day. And then we, we treat things, we come up with a plan, we manage things, we set boundaries, we do all the things, get them in the right, in the right treatment. And then they kind of fade away and like years will go by and things are like pretty stable. And then sometimes it'll, it'll kind of come up again. And so it's, I think we don't always fully know kind of what triggers those, but it's, it, it, it tends to be, you know, kind of peaks and valleys, um, not necessarily, you know, correlated with disease progression or with anything else that we, we kind of know how to measure. Um, and so I think if you can get through these acute periods, <laughs> oftentimes people, you know, people kind of get better. That's a great point. That's a yeah, great I think point. that's important to note is that it doesn't go along with disease progression. Yeah. If anything, it seems to happen early in our experience, um, kind of before people are even diagnosed or kind of around the time they're diagnosed and then tends to kind of like taper off with time. Um, I want to move on to like stealing and gambling because um, that was um, very important to talk about. And, and sometimes there's some moments where somebody may experience some, you know, tossing away finances where they're gambling away money, where they're starting to become a little loose with um, controlling themselves in those spaces. Um, have you ever had somebody who had maybe an issue like that and is not coming to clinic, like refusing, like families just kind of like, I can't get them in here, but they're wasting away everything. Like, how do you tackle? I know that might be a little social worky question. I know you guys work as a team, but have you had to tackle a situation like that? And what came of it? Yeah, so I think, you know, impulsive decisions with finances are another big one that we that we see quite a bit. Um, so spending savings, gambling, making big purchases like cars. We got a patient who was buying airplanes, just like major, huge purchases. <laughs> um, yeah, like spending all the family's money on, you know, on crazy things. And this this happens, you know, not that infrequently. Um, and, you know, a lot of the time people, the patient themselves won't really realize that it's a problem. Um, they'll think, you know, this is just part of my hobby and we needed a new car or we'll kind of, you know, justify it in some way. Um, and again, you know, I think coming up with kind of a plan with these families um, in advance. So we talk a lot about, you know, establishing like financial power of attorney, medical power of attorney, and then doing advanced care planning early. Um, is important to kind of like, you know, setting up these limitations on things. Um, and we have had, you know, families that had to pursue conservatorship um, because the patient just could not, you know, make these decisions and were, you know, was doing things that were very harmful, um, either financially or otherwise to the family. Um, and so I think there, there definitely are um, kind of boundaries that we can help draw um, we work closely with our legal team and we have an ethics team as well that we, we work with, you know, when these issues come up of like, um, you know, is this person competent to be making financial decisions or not? Um, and kind of what, what can we do from a legal standpoint to, to kind of take, take control back? 
um, it's not easy. These things are really touchy and, you know, it's, we don't take away someone's control lightly. Um, and I think it, it get into this, you know, these difficult ethical decisions of like, you know, when can someone make their own decisions and when, when can't they? Um, and it's kind of murky territory. And I think no one likes to do that, but we, at some point, you know, we, we, we get there with some of these families. Curious if you think that, uh, cause I, okay. So before I ask the question, I'm very familiar with this behavior because I saw it in my dad. Um, his, his thing was cars. So he Mm -hmm. would want to go and get cars. Um, I'm curious if you think that goes back to that perseveration or if it's more like a manic state, like you'd see in bipolar where you're, you know, you're in this manic place. And so you do all these crazy things, um, obviously impulse control, um, but if it comes back to that being bored or, you know, where it really, where the root of it would be. Yeah, I think it's probably kind of all of those things. Um, you know, I think it, impulse control is probably kind of at, at the root of it where, you know, um, one of us might be like, yeah, you know, I'd like to get a new car, but you don't go by one that day. You know, you think through it, you think through the process, you think, do I have money in the bank to do this? Um, and so with HD, you might just not even kind of go through that process at all and just go buy the car. Um, yeah. And then I think there's, you know, again, kind of that reward driven behavior. And so it feels good to buy something new and then maybe to go drive across the country and do something, you know, a little bit impulsive. Um, and then also just not kind of understanding the consequences of that behavior too. Um, and for some people, I think it does turn into kind of a perseveration. So they kind of get in the loop where they're, they're thinking about this all day, every day. Um, and their brain kind of gets gets stuck on this circuit um, where they're thinking about the new car or, you know, whatever it is that day. And they kind of go back and back and back to that until they act on it. Um, so I think it's, yeah, I think it's all of these networks, I think, that um, that sort of play into this and make this really hard to treat. And I want to point out, too, it doesn't necessarily have to be something large, like a car or planes or whatever, it can start very small, um, and turn into a problem. So, you know, even one of the things that I notice is even these, um, gambling games on your phone, like it's really easy to get into those anyway, but then, um, for those with HD who are having impulse control or, or even the manic state, and you are finding that that reward center is, is being triggered by these games, it can lead to a problem where you're losing a lot of money that you need. So um, I don't want people to think um, that it all starts like with airplanes, Uh, just because (laughs) I I think it, it starts a lot smaller than that and turns into those larger things. Um, And that addiction comes into, right? Like where, you can start small, but you need to continue to have that fix. And mm-hmm. so you can keep going with it. So um, it keeps getting larger and larger. Yeah, that's a really good point. And it's so easy to like order things online now. Oh my so it's just like you're on your phone on Amazon and all of a sudden, you know, 20 packages show up. And so it's, and then, yeah, like the gambling apps on your phone, there's like stock trading apps. These things are just, there's so much more accessible now. Right there. Um, yeah. And it, yeah. So easy for the impulse to just do it and not even think about it. Like, yeah. oh, well, it's right there. I'm good. And yeah, but yes, it's very hard. So it's almost like, I mean, cause with, I know like that it's, it, that's, I find that difficult for a lot of like myself included, if I'm playing a really fun game, man, I found myself spending a dollar, $2 just to feed some virtual dogs in a game. Like it's ridiculous. And then just thinking about not having that bridge in my mind, you know, that's going like the bridge is open with Mm -hmm. nothing to stop me from continuing to purchase. Um, I would almost think that you'd have to remove like credit cards from like, you'd have to close accounts. You'd have to really do some, even if it's like, kind of uh, behind the back stuff, like with the phone almost, like in order to, I guess, save financially, would you say that that's sometimes a, a path that caregivers or families have to do is to kind of try to try to shrink the world a little bit. So to minimize a larger issue. Yeah. And I think those are all, you know, very real boundaries that can be set. So you can get someone like a credit card with like a very low limit or a debit card with like only a certain amount of money in that account per month and it runs out and your card doesn't work anymore. Um, like taking apps off 
phone, putting like parental controls essentially in place. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, these, these things are way more accessible now, but there are ways to kind of limit that, um, you know, but let someone still do things up to a certain point, um, just kind of prevent them from, from going overboard. Families are trying to weigh the pros and cons, like the, the danger to their family versus their love for their, their loved one. Um, and trying to balance whether they should remove themselves from a harmful situation. So if, mm -hmm. let's say they're, they're bringing in alcohol in some form, they're bringing in drugs, they have children in the home. Um, what, I guess, would you say, or if you've had a family that has experienced this, is it okay for them to remove themselves if it is considered a dangerous situation? Absolutely, yeah, I think they have to. Um, I, you know, yeah, I think if, if you're at risk, Yes, you have to get yourself out of the situation first, no matter how much you love someone, no matter if they have HD or if they don't have HD, if you are at risk. Yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, we spend a lot of time working on safety plans with these families. We really should do it with everyone because, again, you don't know when this stuff is going to come up. Um, but, you know, we we give them, you know, phone numbers to call for like mobile crisis um, for 911 for, you know, our social workers are pretty much on call all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and we will get, you know, calls from families at, at all hours and kind of help to kind of triage these things. But yeah, I mean, number one, you have to protect your own safety. Um, I think no matter what. Um, and we have had instances where patients will, you know, bring drugs to the home with children, bring sex workers home, um, have homeless people living in the bedroom, you know, those kind of things that it gets very out of hand. I think it's, it's easy to see in those situations. Yes, this is a problem. Yeah. Um, but leading up to that, you know, kind of knowing, knowing, you know, kind of what the red, what, what the red flags are and kind of what you are able to tolerate, what you cannot tolerate and what becomes a danger. Um, I think it's important to kind of set those, set those limits with people. Um, but yeah, safety, I think is the number one concern. So if you are, if you are unsafe, get yourself out and then we'll figure it out. I think it's important too for the person with HD, and this is from a person who is gene positive, okay? Uh, I think it's very important for us to also take responsibility. Um, if we're being harmful to others, we still have a responsibility to get help for ourselves, you know, or be willing to take the help um, because obviously you don't want to hurt your loved one. Right. And we can't sit there and say, well, you know, HD made me do it. Well, it doesn't matter what made you do it. You still need to get help for it. And so we, as, as we are dealing with HD now being more aware and proactive than we ever have been, it's our responsibility to really be willing to get that help and be willing to stop having the harmful behaviors. And um, just because we have HD does not mean that our brains can't adapt and learn to do better um, in certain areas like this. And I, and I think it's really important that we take responsibility in those areas because we cannot allow our loved ones to enable our behavior. You know, it, it's harmful to them. It's harmful to, to the children in the house. And so if they enable us, we're asking way too much of people. Um, so at some point, we just have to take responsibility because I think we are in a time where we know cognitively and behaviorally um, we are more aware than we've ever been about this disease. And so it's important to, to use that to our advantage um, and really be more proactive and be willing to help ourselves if we start seeing those behaviors. Because some of us really are aware of what's going on and um, better to take care of it now than wait for it to be at a point when we are not aware and it ruins everything. Um, I, I think that's just an important thing that, that needs to be talked about as well, because it's there's nothing wrong with getting help for something that's harming other people. Um, doesn't make you weak for getting help. That's what's strong, right? Like that's what makes us resilient as a community is being willing to accept help when we need it. Um, so I just really wanted to put that out there. That goes, I, I would say that that goes back to education, right? So it, it, educating yourself and listening to, you know, what Lauren is saying, especially if you are a uh, prodromal, if you are, you know, even at risk, um, you know, educating yourself, learning about different resources and, and taking a look at what, um, 
you know, there is a little bit more of, you have a little bit more control of trying to navigate some of your future now than you ever have been with HD. Um, right. And so I can see that definitely, you know, it's, it's, it's something that's super important for people to know. Um, but it's also super important, like having this webinar for those who really have lost their ability um, and are kind of at this later stage or, or, or kind of does not have this education um, for everyone to be informed on how to navigate that if that is their, their or one of the issues that they kind of are, are struggling with. And, and I think it's very different. You know, if you're you're in the clinical diagnosis, you know, you've got movements and you're mid stages and you're dealing with this. Obviously, that's very different than if you're in this pre manifest stage and you're dealing with cognitive and behavioral symptoms and um, you're you know, you are aware. I mean, there are things that are going on that you are sitting there and you're going, ah, you know, this is questionable or your loved one is telling you. And you're still capable of, of going, you know what, I can get help now for this. And I think that's where that proactive side of this is so important. The safety plans, like you mentioned, doing it for everybody rather than just waiting until somebody is clinically diagnosed. I think that's huge um, because if you have a plan in place, if you know what to do, if you experience these, then it's no longer a taboo subject. It's no longer something to feel ashamed about. You know how to approach this. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean by being aware. Like it, this isn't something that all of a sudden, you know, happens, right? We know the disease is, is gradual and, and things change over time. So it's not like one day you're all of a sudden not aware. Um, so, but I think it's very different, right? If you're already diagnosed or in mid stages and you're dealing with these and your judgment is affected, obviously it's a little bit harder to do, but that's where this team really comes in. But I think it really needs to be said, like if you are in that pre-manifest stage and you are aware of what is going on and somebody tells you, like, hey, this behavior is hurting me. This is something I can't deal with. We, as the person who is causing that harmful, harmful behavior should be willing to go, okay, I need to accept the help and, and do better um, and not feel ashamed for that um, because we're at a point we can do it. So I just, I feel like that's important because um, I don't want it to all fall on caregivers, right? I don't want people to sit here and go, I have a brain disease. And so, you know, none of it matters. No, we have a brain disease, but while we are aware and while we know we can do better, let's do it. Let's be proactive and, and continue to fight HD ourselves. And this is how we do it. We are willing to accept the help and we're willing to, to find a way to make the behavior better um, rather than just saying, I give in to the monster. <laughs> so that's just my opinion. So thank you for always dropping that knowledge because that's it's important for people to hear. Um, and I want to run back to like the safety planning. Uh, we do have a safety workbook as well, and we've done a safety planning video. Um, so on our YouTube site at, at HD Reach, and then on our website at hdreach.org, um, we have touched on that subject. Um, and our I think our workbook's great. I'm biased, but um, check it out. Um, you can never plan too soon or too early. Um, exactly what Lauren is saying. If you have the time, you have your your earlier on in this. Check out some of these videos. Listen to um, you know everything that Dr. McDonald has said, um, and start um, planning with your loved ones and your family to make your life safer and your loved ones safer and just hopefully having a little bit more of a quality of life. Um, but they're very hard topics. They're very difficult things to do and they're not easy. It's not a walk in the park, um, but know that you have resources, you have supports. And I really hope that this video was um, informational um, and helps someone out there who is experiencing something that we've, we've discussed today. Does anybody else have anything else that they'd wanna add? Thank you guys so much for having me. I think just talking about this stuff um, in this forum is is awesome. And I think will be really helpful for people just to know that they're not alone and to know this this can happen in HD. I think just telling people that 
and that, you know, there's help out there and you just, just to be honest with us, you know, whatever you're going through, we've probably dealt with it before. <laughs> We're not going to be freaked out. So just tell us what's going on and then we, then we can find a way to help. That's what I try to tell people too. I'm like, listen, man, HD docs, man, you're not, you're not going to bring them a situation that they haven't heard before or experienced before. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> I know this is why we love our, our HD experts and you guys are you know, wonderful. I'm, right. And, and I'm so grateful for, um, for people like you, Dr. McDonald, who, you know, you fight so hard for us and, um, you're so educated on it and, and that's what we need, right? That's what our community needs. We need to have those professionals who are on our side, who we can go to and not feel ashamed and who we know will help us through it. And, um, I think that's such an important thing. So, um, thank you so much for being willing to talk to us about this today. Thank y'all for having me. You guys do do the hard work. So thank you for, for being here. All right. You can access the rest of our uh, videos for this series at, again, at our YouTube channel, HD Reach, and then on our website, hdreach.org. Thanks for being with us. Thanks.